Hello and welcome to the Practical Leadership Podcast, where I interview great leaders and try to extract their wisdom and experience for you to learn from and hopefully avoid making their mistakes. Check out practical-leadership.academy because you want to help your new managers succeed with hybrid or remote working. Lasso Hamra, thank you for joining me. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this podcast. I'm curious about what we're going to talk about. Well, let's start. Would you introduce yourself, please? Lasse Hamre. Lasse is the same as uh, Larry in English or Lawrence. I'm um, educated in educational science. And I have founded this company I'm working in right now. And I have many roles, have had many roles in this company. And at the present, the business development role, which I really enjoy. When we met many years ago, you were the head guy. You were the yeah. top dog. So when did you actually first become a people manager? Well, I think uh, I have that in my DNA, sort of, because since I was very, very young, I have uh, taken initiative uh, to do stuff. So I have had a leadership role in the Red Cross Youth for many years uh, and uh, on a voluntary basis. And it came easy to me to take initiative and say, let's do that. And people came along and, and did it together with me. So. So that is something that uh, that I've enjoyed for a long time, and I, I actually was um, got all the way up to the, the board of the Norwegian Red Cross as uh, a leader of the whole youth organization. So that that is something I'm very proud about. But it, professionally, I started uh, as a manager when I founded this company <laughs> in 2003. So that that came very abruptly. But uh, you had to start. You have to figure things out, and um, and I think uh, my leadership style has been very much influenced by what I know about learning and change and development. If I could define you, I would be you would be somebody that I would go to to get stuff done. Okay, thank right? you. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean. But you've got a background, you've got a phenomenal background. I think you were underplaying it. And you've got a background in the military. You yeah. are the one who's possibly educated every educational professional in Norway. Everybody I speak to in Norway knows you. They know because you used to you used to lecture on this, didn't you? I did. I had a meeting with one of my former students last week and, and he's working uh, as an Headmaster, you can say, for all the departments uh, in uh, in the Norwegian government. So he has a very prominent role. So we had a very good conversation, and I also learned a lot from the military about you know what is strategy, what is tactics, and it's the same in business. Uh, but they have a very practical approach to it. So that's that's interesting, and I like the practical approach to to leadership has to be practical. As an educator, and you'll have seen this through the military and practiced this, obviously, as an educator of education professionals and your desire is to improve other people, what is the first thing that you tell new managers or new people leaders to do? I say trust your team because if you don't, there's no, you can just walk out the door and leave because it's the team who does the job for you. So you have to trust them. It's the most important thing um, because it's the team. If you trust a team and you manage a team to work well together, they can do magic. And I have an example to, to share with you, Paul. I might have shared with you before, but I, I learned this when I was working at the Swedish Military Academy in Stockholm. And uh, and they trusted the cadet with their own learning, their own learning process. So instead of telling them, you know, what to do, they invited them to create their own plan for 
learning their profession as captains, military or platoon leaders. So an example here is very interesting. They, <clears throat> they, they took the new cadets out to the coast and they demonstrate how to, to, to win a bridgehead along the coast, to uh, a fortified bridgehead. And they were supposed to, they, they watched an exercise uh, with a, a more mature team coming in on a, a, a ship, uh, which is called a fast assault craft, CB90 class. It's, a, it's, a, it's not too big. It's very fast and it can stop uh, on a dime almost because it uh, has these water jet engines and you just reverse the water uh, the water stream and then it stops. This is something you would like to, to have when you are approaching uh, enemy uh, area. You don't want to slowly end up by the coast. So stop abruptly, jump uh, ashore and, and secure the bridgehead. So uh, the young cadets came out there on a Monday and saw that exercise, how it was done. And when the exercise was over, the teacher came to the cadets and said, so today it's Monday. On Friday, you will have to do the same. So here are some manuals. Here are some books. Here are some expertise. You can you can talk to these men, my, my teachers. And here is the assault craft. You're welcome. See you on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that motivating? Ah, uh, what happened? Well, they they had to start by planning their uh, own learning process. So, how are I going to approach this problem? We don't know anything about it, but we have all the means we need to be able to learn this. It's a way. It's made available from for us from our teachers. Uh, so they created their teaching plan. They scheduled in the teachers. They, they had study circles. They, 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 uh, yeah. And when they created their their learning plan, they needed to sort of slice up the task in different subtasks. Tasks. What do we need to know to be able to do that task? And they sliced it up in different subtasks, and then they invited teachers to come and teach them the different stuff. And then they made it on a Friday. Can you imagine how motivating it would be to be part of that team and be given the trust of a assault craft for millions of crowns? I mean, that's an exercise not solely in trust. You, you take immediate ownership of the challenge, mm. and perhaps because you're being trusted. Mm. And then your job is to disassemble the problem to its component parts, learn how to follow each one. That's that's an interesting an interesting approach. What I'm trying to ask. I I have a I have an example from a a large large Norwegian and international company that I've had a conversation about uh, the question of recruitment. So we all know that uh, getting the best brains is almost impossible at the moment. It might be easier if uh, the economy is stopping up. But uh, still, it's very hard to get the, the best brains. So when you when you want to 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 move your business into new areas, how are you going to deal with that? And um, and they came to us and said, oh, how should we think about it? We can't we can't just recruit people because it's just uh, you know uh, businesses overbidding each other in wages and because you don't have the people. And then you come to the question of skilling and reskilling and upskilling and all these things. How, how can you do that best possible way? And this company, they wanted to get into hydrogen, um, uh, the hydrogen industry to, to power vessels and use hydrogen as a, as a clean energy source. Uh, <clears throat> and I said, but, and I was inspired by the, the story from the Swedish military academy. And I said, why, why, why can't we just Make an experiment. We can make it virtual, uh, and we because everything can be made virtual now. You have you have virtual models of everything. Let's create this hydrogen factory, and we invite the people working in your company to be part of that experiment to build this build this virtual model of this factory, and then we run simulations on it. And how would how how would that work? How would we? Uh, the production uh, work. How would the sales work? How uh, would uh, what kind of staff would we need? And we can 
manipulate that in the virtual model. And it's sort of a training exercise, but it's also very motivating and rewarding because you get the ability to try out a future and to learn along the way we go. And this is also what happened when I founded a company. I'd never, I've never founded a company before. I just had to trust the group of people that I gathered to create this. And we made it. <laughs> how so, did yeah. you do it? Well, I mean, how did you go about... I mean, it's easy enough just to say, okay, we'll just trust them to do it. We'll just trust them to experiment. I was talking to somebody the other day, actually, who's feedback from an exercise he did in something very similar was i can't trust my team they're full of idiots yeah yeah it's a big corporate he was a big corporate he was saying that this is the way you need to do it you just need to trust people that they're going to go that it's going to work and the feedback he got from this big corporate was well people in the big corporate was my team are full of idiots yeah. and number one is what the hell are you doing there and why did you hire them in the first place right but <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, I think the, there is a question uh, that comes before that, and that is, how do you build trust? And what can the leader do about that? And uh, it, it's a leadership task. So the leader should ask uh, him or herself, what can I do to build trust? Well, you can't ask the question without answering it. <laughs> well, uh, what did you do to build trust? I mean, you started this company in 2003. There you were. 2003, you were, you were what, 19 years old, right? So, uh, maybe not quite. The, 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 maybe, maybe I'm too radical, I'm not sure. But when we founded this company, it was based on some, on, on some values. And uh, how did we create these values? We were originally three founders. And we had a process where we went deep, deep, deep inside ourselves. And, and the question to yourself was, what is the one thing that is so important for me that if I feel that this value is attacked, I would fight very strongly. And for me, that was my freedom, my freedom to do what I like, to do what I believe in. So I think that sense of uh, uh, having freedom uh, has uh, actually stayed in the company f until today. But then people ask me, but don't you have anarchy <laughs> at work <laughs> if there is freedom? But I believe that the freedom is just one side of a two-sided coin. On the other side, it says responsibility. Because you cannot be free without taking responsibility for everything you do. That's what freedom is. You can't blame anybody else. So if you connect these two things, it's very rewarding because you have the freedom to do what you like, but you have to show responsibility for that freedom that you, you have and, and deliver what you are supposed to deliver and show you're worthy of, of having that freedom. Uh, I don't like micromanagement, so I think the alternative of trusting people is uh, much better. <laughs> okay, so you build trust by having a clear set of values. Yeah. You determine your clear values by understanding what's more important to you, what would you fight for than anything else, mm. and understanding both sides of the coin of whatever, whatever that value set is. Mm. Yeah. How else do you go about building trust? Yeah, okay, so... Uh, you want to trust to your think, team, I, right? I have to think, no, Paul, you ask very good questions. So <clears throat> I think also um, to build trust, you need to show who you are. I, I need to show myself uh, to my team to be personal about my my life, my uh, my status. I'm married to a man, so I have to. And it, is, it doesn't take courage to say this now, but it did when I was younger. But I think uh, you know, showing who you are, what you believe in, how you live your life. It can take courage from anybody, from, from many people, and, and you should show that courage because then you also invite the other team members to be who they are and to feel safe about who they are. That's, that's, that's building trust on a personal level. So once you've got this trust, what can you do with it? Every time we get a mission, uh, I usually start with a, uh, to put that mission into the group. And the first question I ask is, how should we think about it? 
how should we approach this? How should, and I think that comes from my learning approach. You know, how do we, how do we work with this question together? And then we have a discussion about that first before we start solving the task. Because then we have a sort of a plan on, on how, how we're going to work to solve a problem. And, and I'm in the consulting industry, so there are always new cases that we've never done before. And we have to, you know, have a conversation about how should we as a team approach this problem. So you're asking the, it's the, the meta yeah. question about the, okay, yeah. the situation you, itself. How do you approach yeah. it? And the question is very, very important because what we are looking for is an answer. And uh, I would like to, to quote uh, Matrix, which is a film which was very important to me in the 90s. The answer is out there, Neo. It's looking for you. So what you have to do is, you know, to create an atmosphere where we can find the answer. Because the answer is always there in the some situation somewhere. And to find that answer, that's a team effort. I have to trust my team to find it because I don't find it alone. I need to have that conversation, the different perspectives, the different competences, and also the, the quite specific things that we have ahead of us. People see different things in, in, in um, a pitch, for instance. In your long and illustrious career so far, has there been a particular event or a mistake, something that's happened that you've learned something from? What is the, what is the thing that is common from all these mistakes? And it usually boils down to one thing, and that is that I didn't clear with the, the group what expectations they had about what we're going to do right now. Uh, so when, when you, I don't know if this is a good example because it was quite messy and I was, it was very embarrassing, but it was a very prestigious project for the Red Cross. They wanted to create a training program to, uh, to raise the competence and awareness within Red Cross about sexual abuse. And we came to uh, this uh, working group um, with our methodology of how to create a training program. And they wanted something completely else. And I don't really know what they wanted, but they were so offended that they almost screamed at us. And I think it is also because the, the, uh, the subject matter is very delicate and it's a lot of, you know, different emotions coming to, and we didn't really check that out before we started. I could easily just have asked, so what are your expectations to this meeting? And it would never have happened the way it did. It was very embarrassing, very, very embarrassing. <laughs> uh, but sometimes I forget it, still forget it, to check the expect expect expectations and, and then uh, the risk is there. We can end up in a very unpleasant place. There's a lovely question um, that somebody suggested that you ask of the people around you, uh, which is, how would you like to be managed? And then talking to your boss and saying, I would like to be managed like this. <laughs> yeah. And I think the expectations that you are clarifying there, not necessarily desire, because how would you like to be managed? Well, completely laissez-faire, leave me alone, just pay me money. Or you go to your client and you're asking, what is it you actually want? And I think the second part of asking the question is actually listening to the answer. It's easy yeah. enough to say, oh, what is it you actually want? Training course. Mm. Great. I can do training courses. I like to think that that is one of my superpowers uh, <laughs> to listen into a group. Sometimes, you know, I, many times I, I have walked into completely new groups, opened the door, walked into the group, and the, the same second I know exactly how this group is feeling. It's nothing magic about it. I think it's just um, a lot of, lot of experience. And I think also it comes from my experience as a singer in a choir, because the may, most important thing when you sing in a choir is to listen. It's even more important than singing. It's to create, I mean, you're trying to create harmony. I mean, yeah. you're, you're, I think you're one of the founders of one of the largest, most famous choirs in Norway. Yeah, um, I was one of the founding fathers. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't brag of my uh, participation in the actually setting up of the choir, but I was there from, on the first rehearsal and I've been into every production for 18 years. Yeah, That'll do. Mm. That'll do. <laughs> and the next Christmas performance is going to be on NRK. It's going to be on front and center on the Christmas mm. 
schedule. So that's going to be amazing yeah. with the, the Norwegian Philharmonic Orchestra. It's brilliant. Um, but singing in that choir, and I love to sing as well, yeah. you are, you're trying to create harmony. So it's not one voice. It's one voice among many. And using that perceptive ability you have to make sure that you are singing the right note at the right time, does that help you pick out the, the, the sentiment or the, the, the sense of what's going on in a group? So the choir is trying to create a, a product. And the product is the experience of the listener, of the audience. And, and my voice doesn't matter in that sense because they're not there to listen to me they're there to listen to the choir so we perform as a group i become part of the group uh, and I sort of blend in to that group and create a harmony together with my co-singers so the, the the product is something we made together and i think this is a very nice thread to go back to where i started to trust in the group because if you if you want to create something with a group, you sort of have to to listen to the group as a whole. And, and the, the, maybe there is room for a soloist somewhere. But it, the soloist couldn't have become a soloist if it wasn't for the group. So you have to sort of give credit to everybody to take responsibility for their part and become part of the, 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 the big work that we, we do together. Is that yeah. being responsible for your own part to... Not to the exclusion of everybody else, right? I've got to do my job as part of the team. But I think when you think about how most people approach teamwork, they think about it as I need to play my part. So I'm going to do my thing. I'm mm. going to do my thing very, very well. Mm. But what you're talking about is going into a room, into the choir, into the team with your ears and your, your senses open to understand where you fit. Yeah. Does that mean that you submerge yourself yeah, I sort of get that feeling sometimes. It's it's wonderful. So what I I have to I have to tap into is the is the the right uh, tune and the right rhythm, and to have the same pulse as everybody else in the group and be part of something bigger. And it it's so wonderful that it almost makes me cry. But sometimes you feel that also when you have uh, you work together as a team that people really listen. To each other and and they they're trying to make something bigger uh, than each and every one of the team members could have done for themselves listening to the pulse of the team what would you like to thank young lassa for doing yeah well i you know i was a young guy didn't know my place in the world i tried different stuff uh but I'm very happy that I found my uh, way into choir at the age of 11 as a young soprano. <laughs> now I am second bass. Uh, but having that journey and a long career in a choir, that, that uh, I didn't realize that then. But now uh, I see that it really has uh, influenced uh, who I am and how I think about the world. And, and being a member of different groups. My son just started to sing yesterday. He did? He did. He's oh, eight. It warms my heart. Yeah, he, he just joined the Velmead Voices and he came back all aglow. <laughs> it's wonderful to see you. Now that's nice. So mm. you're grateful to your younger self for joining the choir so that perhaps that has influenced your sense of harmony, of rhythm of unity of team lastly just as we wrap up how can people find you so they can find me on twitter with my name Lasse Hamre and also on LinkedIn I try to post uh, my opinions about uh, learning there so if you're interested in, in how I look at that you can look at my LinkedIn and uh, we also have a web page Ask.no. We have translated everything into English. So if you're curious, have a look there as well. Marvelous. Well, it just remains for me to say from military to choir, through teamwork, trust, experimentation, freedom, and responsibility. Lasa Hamla, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. 
That's a wrap. Thank you for joining me today. Your homework is to leave your five-star review and please, any comments you have, you really help me to improve every day. And it also helps people to discover me online. You should check out practical-leadership.academy because you want to help your new managers succeed with hybrid or remote working.